Good day. I am H. Robert Silverstein, MD, for the Preventive Medicine Center and West Hartford Cable Access TV. If you have any questions about this uh, program, uh, you may e email us at info at the PMC .org, uh, the Preventive Medicine Center. In, just look for the email, contact and uh, we'll get back to you and or just give us a call at the office, 860-549-3444. Now, usually at the end, I say something like uh, the story, I always tell the same boring story about my son, uh, who when he was in college, uh, used to sign his letters home to me to say SMF, send millions fast. Both West Hartford Cable Access TV and the Preventive Medicine Center are 501c3 organizations, which means they are charitable and tax-deductible organizations if you make a cont contribution. So with that in mind, let's begin today's program. Now, how many of you out there know who Jimmy Durante is? Uh, I, I know almost no one. Jimmy Durante was a comedian who was called the schnoz because he had a big nose. Uh, and uh, one, of, one of his usual lines that he repeated often was, I've got a million of them. He'd tell a joke, and then he'd say, I've got a million of them after the uh, audience laughed. Well, uh, I'm going to use that line today and show you this. Uh, that didn't flip very well, but there's probably 12 sheets here. And on each sheet, uh, there is an essay. And I've, at the Preventive Medicine Center website, there are hundreds of essays on all kinds of subjects about how to be well, how to prevent disease, even a little bit of entertainment and so on. But to, for today's talk, I have uh, decided to go over just two that are complementary to each other. The first one's called, I don't like brown rice, vegetables, and beans. And the second one is called, looking to the right and not looking to the left. Now, what does the one, I don't like brown rice, vegetables, and beans mean? It means that I grew up in America when we ate fried chicken, steak, hamburgers, pizza, uh, candy, cake, cookies, and so on. And uh, everybody was doing it, and nobody thought very much about diet. And the incidence of heart disease began to become apparent. Clark Gable died of heart attack. Uh, uh, Robert um, oh, Shaw. Uh, who was in the movie Jaws. He died of a heart attack. Uh, recently, uh, uh, Gandolfini, well, I don't recall what his first name is, uh, was vacationing in Italy, I believe. He had a heart attack and died, uh, when I say recently, the past few years. And um, so it is, uh, Lyndon Johnson had heart disease. Dwight Eisenhower had hardening of the arteries and a heart attack. Um, let's see, who else? Uh, it doesn't quickly come to my mind. Regardless, uh, so the point being is, why was there so much heart disease? And the answer is, it wasn't magic, it wasn't evil, it wasn't a curse, it was what people did. Now just last night, I was reading about a physicist who apparently discovered the relationship between cholesterol and hardening of the arteries heart attack. Uh, Heberden originally described, in the 1700s, originally described angina, which is a symptom of inadequate blood flow to the heart muscle. And as a result, uh, the heart muscle lets you know that uh, it's not getting enough blood flow. And so it creates this discomfort that you feel, which can be any discomfort between the belly button and the mouth, and occasionally higher up, uh, including the neck, shoulders, and arms, front or back. So um, anyhow, so there were these steps where cholesterol was recognized as being related to developing hardening of the arteries. And then there was uh, the identification of the receptors on the cells for cholesterol. And that got uh, Brown and Goldstein the Nobel Prize. And then there was the invention of the techniques of open heart surgery by Rene Favaloro, uh, who did the first uh, bypass. Uh, then there was the first uh, angioplasty by Gruntzig, uh, who was, I think, in Switzerland and came to Emory University, my old tomato. Uh, that's a joke on the word alma mater. Uh, anyhow, uh, so uh, there have been these steps. Then came the stents, uh, the uh, refinement of the lima and rima, uh, left internal mammary artery, right internal mammary artery, use of the radial artery to do bypass surgery. 
in a completely preventable condition. There is an entire industry out there, which I am part of, that in a certain sense sits back and waits for people to hurt themselves to the point where they then require medical care. Come see me in the office. I get to charge you an office visit. It's not as grim as I'm making it out. We are here to serve and people have the right to choose. But uh, why not choose freedom? Aha, I don't like brown rice, vegetables, and beans. The flip side of that is that's how to get your freedom. Freedom from disease, freedom from the need for medications, freedom from procedures like angioplasty, stents, medications, and medication side effects. One of my positions about medications, and again, uh, I try to be funny, it's not my nature, I'm a little bit heavy handed, uh, is that uh, all medicines are poison, including the ones I prescribe. Now, I just do that to be dramatic so you get the idea that nobody should be on medicine. But I also say, including vitamins, minerals, herbs, and supplements, be well, use as few as possible. By the way, if you want to lose a few pounds, stop taking multivitamins. I can't tell you how many people multivitamins have caused weight gain in, and when they stop taking their multivitamin, uh, their weight goes down. And I believe, I believe, uh, do I have proof? Maybe, uh, that vitamins, minerals, herbs, supplements should only be taken five days a week to prevent what I call adaptation. In other words, you get used to something. Like in the beginning when you start smoking cigarettes, you can only handle a half of one or one or an occasional whatever, but eventually you keep it up, you can handle two packs a day or even more, like I did. Uh, so, and the same with coffee. You can use no-dose or coffee to stay up, but if you keep drinking it, eventually you get used to it. I am trying to have you not get used to whatever it is that you're taking. What about prescription drugs? That's a little bit different. I would like to say that only take them five days a week the way I say about vitamins, minerals, herbs, and supplements, but I can't be rigid about that. And my patients, I don't have taking prescription medications five days a week as a general rule. For instance, what if you uh, were diabetic on insulin? Would I have you take your insulin only five days a week? That's nuts. No, you can't do that. Uh, by the way, 95% of diabetes is completely curable, preventable, curable. 95% of diabetes, 95% of high blood pressure, 95% of high cholesterol, 95% of high triglycerides. And even depression, anxiety are vastly improved by doing the things like, I don't like brown rice, vegetables, and beans. Now, what do I actually mean by that? What I mean is that brown rice, vegetables, and beans can be made to taste really good. But hands down, and maybe that's because I'm still, quote, addicted or whatever the right word is. I never say close quote. Um, and I'd like to say close quote because I'm quote, addicted, close quote. That doesn't sound right. Anyhow, you get the idea. Um, addicted to French fries and pizza and hamburgers and steak and lobster and butter and uh, really nice uh, pastas and breads with butter on them and so on and so on. And I'm trying to make the point, as is made in this essay, called I don't like brown rice, vegetables, and beans, that we are drawn to what we should not. We are drawn to what we should not. We are not drawn to what we should. When I said I don't like brown rice, vegetables, and beans, that doesn't mean I dislike them. That just means that they don't give me the same kick, taste, fun, party, whatever, as all those foods that I mentioned, the ice cream, the uh, hamburger, the french fries, the steak, the lobster and butter, and so on and so on. And the taste, I can remember I often say, I had a meal that was lobster in a cream sauce at a French restaurant in Montreal, and to this day I still say that was the best meal I ever had in terms of taste. But when you think about what it is, my goodness, that is exactly what keeps me in business as a cardiologist. And it is also what keeps the oncologist in business. So we have heart disease 
and we have the endocrinologist with their diabetes, and we have the oncologist with their cancers and so on. Now, we don't know the cause of all diseases. Like, what is the cause of acute myelogenous leukemia? I really don't know. But if you're going to talk about the Willie Sutton rule, Willie Sutton was a bank robber who, when he was asked why he robbed banks, he gave the very lucid answer of, that's where the money is. And so if you want to uh, talk about where the d high disease frequency and the greatest amount of money that's being spent, I've already sort of named those conditions. High blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, cancer, diverticulitis, uh, et ulcer disease, gastritis, irritable bowel, all of those things pretty much come from what we do. Now you might say, well, do you know which ones? Yes, I know which ones, and there's just so much time, so I can't really get into it to go on to it. Now, what happens if you do the brown rice, vegetables, bean thing, and you're not a cigarette smoker, and you're not using cocaine, and you're exercising decently, you're taking 30-minute walks uh, three, four times a week, ideally more, you have low percent body fat, positive attitude, stop complaining, positive attitude, do what you need to do to get things done. And uh, so that's breathing, drinking, eating, exercise, and the last one is the psychological called unrealistic expectations. Forgive me, but bad things happen. It is important to accept that reality and then deal with it with humility as best you can. I wish I'd brought uh, uh, an essay that was written by this doctor in the New England Journal of Medicine, and she talked about where she had such a tough day at work, and then she came home and she saw her kids in bed and that uh, made her feel really good. No discussion of her husband or ex-husband, by the way. And I thought that was uh, a little bit uh, inappropriate. W uh, the husband was half of the creator of those wonderful children that she was describing. But really, the essay got down to um, a very brilliant friend of mine used the word sophomoric, and my response was that she needed to stop whining and accept the difficulties of being a doctor. It is not easy being a physician. It is not easy being a physician. If you are a good physician, it's very hard work. It's very hard work. And it takes a great deal of concentration and you don't go home and kick your shoes off and sit back and watch TV and have a few drinks every night. I know there are physicians who do that and I made a joke to a friend of mine recently that 33% of uh, physicians graduated in the lower one third of their class. Well, you know, we like to have somebody who's relatively smart. By the way, that idea is a little scary to me because I did not graduate first, second, or third in my class. I graduated fourth in my high school class. Uh, so I graduated in the top 10% because I'm just not that academically, I wasn't that academically talented, but now I'm pretty smart because I kind of keep working at it. Oh, I know, I know. Quit patting myself on the back and saying what a great uh, guy I am. But uh, I must admit uh, that it had personal tolls on my life to be as dedicated, if, and again, quit patting myself on the back, to be as interested, to be as involved in uh, the delivery of care and medicine. I'm getting a little peripheral to the point, but the point is human freedom. I call myself an abolitionist physician, and once again, think I'm so clever for saying exactly that. Are we approaching 15 minutes yet? 15 minutes. An abolitionist physician is one who prevents disease. Well now, uh, we're going to change subjects, uh, and the reason we're going to change subjects is because I want to make this show be in two parts. So that was the first part. The next part is going to be about uh, uh, cooking and exercise. Now, uh, in cooking, what is it that we should be eating, which is what the cooking should be about. I love to listen to uh, uh, the, the shows on uh, national public radio, uh, the cooking shows, because they are always portraying exactly the foods that keep me in business as a physician. It's either some wine or some mixed drink 
or some fancy dessert or some cream laden pasta and so on and so on. Once in a while they have somebody on who talks health. As a matter of fact, I was on once. Uh, and uh, talking about health is not really a lot of fun on radio or TV because it's not the foods people are usually used to. Uh, the um, foods that uh, are right for our anatomy, physiology, biology, what are they? Well, how do we decide what we should be doing? And the way to decide that is we have an enzyme for digesting plant food in our salivary glands. Not for digesting meat or cheese or eggs, it's for digesting unprocessed plant foods. I'm not talking about Wonder Bread or white flour bread. I'm talking about brown rice, vegetables, beans, fruit, nuts, and seeds. We have an enzyme that is to digest plant food carbohydrate. Then the jaws of a carnivore come down like a pair of scissors, whereas our jaw comes down like all the other herbivore vegetarians to grind. Uh, we're like chimpanzees, we're like gorillas, we're like horses, goats, cows. We're supposed to munch and grind our food. Now, so we have a jaw that functions like an herbivore vegetarian. We have an enzyme for digesting vegetarian plant food here. Uh, we don't have any fangs or claws like carnivores. Uh, carnivores means eats meat. Uh, carnivores can digest rotten meat safely. Human beings cannot digest rotten meat safely. There's a whole list of reasons why we are biologically designed to eat essentially an unprocessed whole foods vegan diet. Now, uh, that's at the, I don't believe we have to do anything at the 100% level. For instance, what's my position on alcohol? I don't think alcohol is good for anybody, but my position would be four drinks a week or less is almost certainly safe. Four six ounce glasses of wine. Now, if you think about it, what did he just say? He said a six ounce glass of wine. A glass of wine is five ounces. So I'm trying to be a little bit uh, friendly. Uh, I'm trying to make a point and not offend people too much. <clears throat> That's not true, you know that. I sort of don't care. I'm going to tell you the truth. I have a reputation for being ferocious, uh, but it's ferocious about the truth. And I don't care what you think or what you're used to. I'm going to tell you what hopefully my knowledge, education, insights are uh, about what I believe is the physiologic truth. There's this um, cardiologist online. Uh, what's he called? The skeptical cardiologist. And uh, he's interesting, but I think he's wrong. Anyhow, getting back to what we're supposed to eat. So I believe that we're supposed to eat unprocessed, ideally organic, whole food, which is another way of saying plant food or vegan, at the 90% level. 90% level, as I've already said, would be something like four glasses of wine a week, um, uh, one cigar a month. But the things we're not supposed to do. What if you break your arm and you need a narcotic? Am I opposed to the use of narcotics? There's a time and a place for everything. Um, I, it may come to whether or not I have hip surgery. Uh, will I use narcotics? I remember that when I fractured my hip in 1991, I wouldn't take narcotics then, but I also wouldn't get out of bed. And uh, that's a surefire risk, especially at my age now, for the development of clots in my legs uh, to then travel to the lung called pulmonary emboli. So um, anyhow, we, we have this biology that is a certain way, and I'm going to tell you about it, uh, my perspective, very much invitation to consider, which is another, I can say it a little bit nastier, take it or leave it, um, and I tell my patients that. I don't tell them in a hostile fashion, but I say to them, you know, you don't have to have me as a physician. You don't have to believe what I say to you. You don't have to do what I encourage you to do. You are free to choose, but I am trying to maintain that freedom as much as is possible, and I'm telling you what the rules are. For instance, what about driving your car 90 miles an hour? 
But what about having six drinks and driving home and wiggling your way through traffic and hoping that the police don't arrest you for DWI? The point is there are rules of all types. And when you go along with the biologic rules, you don't develop diseases. Now, there are some smart ideas. And one that I have right here is called MISO. Uh, so if you go to the website, www.thepmc.org, the Preventive Medicine Center is what I just said, www.thepmc.org. Uh, this is a very old handout, so it may or may not be on the website, but I talk about MISO here. Now, what is MISO? MISO is a cultured, that means like yogurt, um, cultured salted soybean paste. And what you do is you make soups with it. It is the bouillon for soup, but it's healthy bouillon. What's interesting about MISO is it's alive like wild brine sauerkraut. Sorry to advertise a brand name, but that one has to come out. Just like I like organic veal miso. And the reason is I, both of those have my confidence, so I don't want you walking into any store and just picking out uh, miso off the shelf uh, and so on. I have specific ideas in mind that I sort of believe in and I believe are the right decisions, which is filtered through my years and years of experience. How many years of experience are we talking about? We're talking about almost 50 years of experience. That does not mean I'm right. That just means that I have a lot of experience in either being right, wrong, or indifferent. And sometimes I'm right and sometimes I'm wrong. So how are you supposed to figure it out? You're supposed to figure it out by taking a look at the way I present my information and say to yourself, does what he say sound reasonable, and does he at least have some facts or information that supports the ideas that he puts forth? And I think I do that. So anyhow, I recommend miso and miso soup. Very, very healthy for you, and can be made with seaweed. I know, it sounds like I'm talking Japanese. I am talking Japanese, Japanese, Chinese, and... Um, but it's something that you can find. What do I think about going into the average oriental restaurant and ordering miso soup? Not so much. I love to say not so much. I, whenever I hear that, I sort of get off a little bit on it. I think it's so cool, not so much. But uh, uh, so you want to boil your vegetables. And after you boil your vegetables, you want to take some of that broth and put it in a little container over here. Then you put your miso in there and you grind it up and make, no, you don't grind it up. You make a slurry. Then you take your vegetable broth and put it in your plate. And you take some of this slurry that you've made to begin to flavor it. And you put in some and that's not enough. And you put in a little more and that's not enough. And then you put in more and that's too much. Okay, you take more of the broth from the soup pot and uh, put it in uh, the bowl to dilute it down a little bit. And uh, that's how you make miso soup. When you're cooking your vegetables, which are all vegetables except potatoes, potatoes equal white flour, bread, equal sugar, equal candy, uh, all vegetables uh, in your soup mix with garlic and cilantro and dill and lemon, and you can throw in some uh, canned beans to make your life easy. Uh, Eden canned beans are available locally. Uh, Trader Joe's has some... Uh, has some great uh, you know, garbanzo beans with low percent sodium. So you wash off these canned beans, that makes life easy. Or soak your own and put them in with your vegetable broth, but it doesn't take that long to make the vegetable broth. So you want to have your beans already cooked. And then uh, you have miso soup with seaweed and beans. Uh, is there a best bean? Uh, traditionally, the best bean is the A-D-U-K-I or A-Z-U-K-I, azuki bean, aduki bean. And uh, what about the other beans? What about lentils? What about chickpeas? What about cannellini beans, black-eyed peas, split peas? They're all fine. Uh, I was sort of taught that aduki beans were the best. So uh, I have no sense to argue with that. All right, that's the deal with miso soup with seaweed in it. Uh, you can buy seaweed at the natural food stores, and you can also order it at Maine Coast Sea Vegetables. And if you buy the larger packages, they're very expensive, but they last uh, like $50. Uh, they last for years or a year or two. So you only need a little bit here, a little bit there. Seaweed are incredibly high in protein. They're incredibly high in absorbable calcium. 
and they are also, quote, detoxing sort of like a sponge. Now, I know doctors are going to say, what kind of nonsense is that he's talking about a sponge that sucks out the bad stuff and so on and so on. Look, uh, this has been refined over thousands of years in the Oriental cultures, and I'm a believer. All right, <clears throat> looking to the right and looking to the left. I got to get through this one quickly. Uh, that's about deciding what you're going to do when you're presented with temptation. And what you have to do is you have to engage your brain to clear yourself of your addictive nature. And most of us operate on just automatic. We do these things and we do them repeatedly and we do them wrong repeatedly. And yes, some people do them right and God bless them. But for most of us, it's a struggle to do the right thing. So what you want to do is sit there and simply realize it is no more complicated to eat the right food and not eat the wrong food than it is to turn your head from here to here. You just don't do these things and you just do these things. And you might say, well, who's going to prepare that for me? Look, I didn't say it was easy. I didn't say it was fun. There is a price to your freedom. And the question is, do you want to pay the price to have your freedom? That's up to you. And, and people who don't pay attention and pay that price are the ones who end up going to the oncologist and the cardiologist and uh, so on and so on. Most of the diseases that we have in the United States are completely preventable. Today I've talked about methods to do that, and I wish you all well. So once again, if you have any questions, please contact us at the Preventive Medicine Center at 860-549-3444. Good day and God bless you all. I am H. Robert Silverstein, MD.